All right, folks, welcome into another brand new video edition of the 901 Soccer Podcast here as part of Bluff City Media. You can find the 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter at 901 Soccer Pod. You can find us on Facebook as well. Just search 901 Soccer and we will pop right up. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can find Bluff City Media on Twitter at Bluff City underscore media. And you can find Bluff City Media on Facebook as well. All you have to do is search Bluff City Media. They should pop right up, just like they're the 901 Soccer Podcast. Uh, so we got a good one in store for you tonight. I I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling pretty good. I am in a good mood. You know, I've come on here, I've done some of these shows, and I've I've been I've been upset. I've used phrases like "showed their ass." Uh, that's not the case tonight. We're it's it's all positive tonight. All positive. Maybe one negative thing, which yeah, you know, we'll see. Uh, maybe one negative thing, but that's about it. But it's all for the most part positive tonight, and. Uh, so, you know, we're going to talk, you know, 901 FC's been on the road a lot lately, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, I think, you know, it's only been two games since the last 901 FC home game, but still a lot of time on the road in the last month or so for 901 FC, so we're definitely going to discuss that. Uh, with the opponent being Tampa tonight, <clears throat> going to have to mention how last season ended against Tampa, which was just the worst so we'll, we'll, we'll momentarily go down a not-so-happy part of memory lane, but then we'll talk about the game tonight, talk about how, uh, while it was nice to get revenge on Tampa, this game did feel a little bit different. It felt similar to a different Memphis 9 FC game at around this same part of the calendar year, uh, and we'll definitely touch on that, and if I forget, Fry my ass and and on Twitter and in the comment section because uh, I said it in the press box as it was happening. I said it in the car when I was on the phone with somebody on the way home, and I'm saying it to you now. So for whatever reason I forget between now and then, and this gets posted, definitely light me up because just the fact that I'm building it up like this should tell you what game this reminds me of. But we'll definitely touch on that, and then we'll take a look at the schedule coming up, and then we will close it out. So the last two games for 901 FC, so they, they so to back it up, basically in July and August, they had a grand total of two home games. From July the 12th until today, they had two home games. They had at Oakland, at Sacramento, home against Orange County, at Pittsburgh, at Loudoun, at Indy, at San Diego, home against Indy, at Charleston, at Detroit. That is a stretch of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's 10 games. Eight of them are on the road. Two of them are at home. That's tough. And we'll maybe touch on how that could be affecting the attendance, which is not great. 2,200 and change, which if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to have to double check the spreadsheet that I have saved on my flash drive at work. You'd think at this point in time I would know to bring it home and plug it in, but for some reason I keep not doing that, and for some reason I'll probably keep not doing that, even though by all accounts I should do that. Um, but if tonight was not the lowest crowd in 901 FC history, it was, if I'm memory serving, it's no better than third worst. It may be second worst, but I'm pretty sure it's the worst crowd in 901 FC history. The only other ones I can think of would be the Pittsburgh opener last year, which was a day where it was all snowy and icy outside and the grounds crew moved uh, moved mountains, moved heaven and earth to be able to get the field playable for that night. And then I think the either the Orange County game or the Indy game. It was one, one of the last two home games was, was bleak. I think it was the Indy game because the Indy game was a Wednesday game, much like tonight's game against Tampa. But anyway, that's I, I do feel like – being away from home for that long, especially for a team like 901 FC, really hurts the attendance. I mean, you had that three-game stretch. It got, it's you know, you saw a little bit of an uptick, not dramatically, but you saw a little bit of an uptick when they had that three-game homestand and four out of five in the month of June. They had four home games in the month of June. Miami, Detroit, Tulsa, Charleston. Unfortunately, I was not here for the Charleston game. But you saw a little bit, the you know, I if I went back and looked, I'd say those are probably the third, fourth, and fifth best crowds of the year. But I digress. That's that's probably that that's a topic that deserves its own article and its own podcast. And 
that's probably going to have to be for when the season is over so that we have a full set of data to work with. But anyway, eight out of 10 games on the road, that's a struggle. So you come home against Tampa tonight. Your last two games, you know, the run of of form's been streaky. Form has been streaky this season. Let's just be real. Uh, You started off one, two, three, four without a win, and then you went obviously 12 in a row unbeaten, which was fantastic. And then you hit a slump, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven without a win. Four without a win, 12 unbeaten, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven without a win. That's tough. That's very all back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's 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 tough to handle. But because of that 12-match unbeaten run, they are still comfortably within the playoff places. They got work to do if they want to make sure they get a home playoff game, but they are still well within the playoff places. They probably just have to go on the road. Um, but tonight, don't, don't let me forget, topic for, for later in the show. And you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just write down that down in my notes. Uh, that's chicken scratch, but I can read it. Um, yeah, so they, they, they got a little bit of work to do, but, you know, tonight's a good step. But so you go on the road, you get a, you get a, you start to turn things around. You get that nil nil draw with Loudon, two one win on the road at Indy, one zero win on the road at San Diego, and let's be real, nine one FC basically ended San Diego Oil. That's that's what you know. Not too long after they said, all right, we're shut, we're shutting it down. No more. We can't this. this we can't do it. I don't want to see this time to shut it down. We ended San Diego Oil. I know that's not the case, but let me have my fun, damn it. Um, then home for a very, that the Indy 11 game on the 23rd of August, that was a nil, nil draw. That was the game where the main topic of discussion was the field being so terrible. Then you go on the road, you play Ben Pierman in Charleston, you lose one, nothing. Then you go on the road this past Saturday at Detroit. And I think it's worth noting that in neither in the buildup to both of these Detroit games this year, there has not been hardly any vitriol or venom or stupid takes. Or I'm sure I'm sure there were stupid takes from the Detroit fans because that's just what they do. They fire off stupid takes. They go to war with their own organization. They're awful, terrible people, and bad things should happen to them. But uh, in the lead up to both of the games this year, you didn't see or hear a lot of from them. And thank God. Because I was tired of the, and you know, I was able to, to to rally the rally the troops here in Memphis, and you know, we we gave a good account of ourselves, and after much tough fighting, we're able to emerge victorious against the scumbags of, that are the Northern Guard supporters. And you didn't have any of that leading up to these games, and the only thing that I can think of is that their team stinks and has spent the bulk of the season on the outside looking in of the playoff race, and so. When 901 FC fell behind 1 0, that was, that was, I was like, don't do this to me, guys. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then they equalized, and all was right in the world because now, through three games last year and two games this year, 901 FC has still never lost to Detroit, which, hang on, I cleaned my table off. Coming right. I think I got it sitting right over here. And yes, you see, it, it, yep, Detroit sucks right there. See? Yes, that's uh, always going to have that handy for when I do a show because you never know when you might need to say that Detroit sucks. The city itself, I have no idea. I have never have never been. Might end up going someday. Who knows? But Detroit City and their fans, two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. So that sets up a home game against Tampa Bay, who has already clinched a playoff spot at this point. And at this point, now we have to take a very sad and hurtful trip down memory lane. But I am here for you, just as you have been there for me. We're going to get through it together, guys. So last year, obviously, 901 FC had one of the best season in club history. They hosted a playoff game against the aforementioned scumbags from Detroit, knocked them out of the playoffs, eat it. And that set up a home game against the Tampa Bay Rowdies. That was an interesting matchup because Tampa Bay had beaten you already, but you had also beaten them. The home team won each of the regular season meetings between the two teams. 
there was a spot in the Eastern Conference Final on the line on the road at Louisville. And that was something where it was going to be, if, if, if Memphis won the game, it was going to be a bloodbath because not two months before, Don Onassi had gone up to Louisville and had multiple players sent off after the final whistle, just as Louisville had a player sent off after the final whistle. So with a spot in the USL championship game on the line, two teams in two cities that don't like each other, two teams that don't like each other, that was going to be a bloodbath, and it was going to be glorious. The 901 Soccer Podcast was going to go on the road and cover the team. It was going to be amazing. It was going to be fantastic. Unfortunately, that did not come to pass. There ended up being, well, let's go. Let's, I've got something saved. It's floating around here on the computer somewhere. So you had, it was a, well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. If we, the very first game in 901 FC history was against the Tampa Bay Rowdies before a crowd of 8,062. Still, at this time, I believe the third largest crowd in 901 FC history. Tampa found a way to spoil our very first ever game. They scored a penalty three minutes into the game, and that was all she wrote. Then last year in the playoffs, back and forth game, everybody's on the edge of their seat, 90th minute, penalty to Memphis. I'm over the moon at this point. I'm like, holy hell, it's happening. We're going to score the penalty. That's going to be the game. We're going to Louisville. We can win a championship. It's It's happening. It's ha- like it's all happening. It's all the, the 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 trophy lay before it like a sunlit savanna. It lay before us, and up stepped Aaron Malloy. Penalty saved. Oh, that sucks. Damn. Oh, no. Well, extra time. Okay, fine. Extra time. I can live with extra time. And then the crowd of six thousand sixty three. The largest crowd of uh, the second or large, the largest or the second largest crowd of last year. Deflate. You go from here down to here. And then Tampa gets a penalty and you go down to here. And then Tampa converts the penalty and you go down to here. And that's the game. And that's how your season ends. And that's Ben Pierman's last game on the sideline for 901 FC. Rough, rough, rough stuff. Yes, I sort of just sounded like a dog. Rough, rough, whatever. Um, That was painful. No doubt about it. That was the last meeting between these two teams. So that set up tonight. A chance for revenge. And it there's nothing quite like playoff meetings to set up storylines for future regular season meetings, if that makes sense. You know, sometimes teams don't really have much to say about each other, but for whatever reason, they meet in the playoffs and something just clicks. And like the the Grizzlies and the Clippers for years. There's no, I dropped my pen again. There's no, no real reason other than stylistically that the Grizzlies and the Clippers should have been a rivalry, but they met in the playoffs. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the 2012 playoffs where Lionel Hollins had the two best defenders in the league sitting on the bench while the Grizzlies squandered a 30-point lead. And the Clippers stole game one, and then the Grizzlies dropped game seven at home and lost the series four to three. And then the next year, the Grizzlies returned the favor in the playoffs. I believe that was the Zach Randolph choke slam of Blake Griffin and Tony Allen kicking Chris Paul in the face series. And stylistically, they were different styles. Make fights. You had Those were the... Lob City Clippers, known derisively here in Memphis as the Flop City Clippers. Uh, And the Grizzlies, that was the heart of the grit and grind era. That was probably the peak of the grit and grind era. That 2013 playoffs where they went to the Western Conference Finals, if I'm not mistaken, against the Spurs. And for whatever reason, like that was like then those regular season games took on a whole layer of significance, much as we saw with 901 FC in the in Detroit City last year. They played twice in a regular season, and Memphis lost neither of them. And they played in the playoffs, and 901 FC beat them 3-1 to one and knocked them out. And uh, that just sustained 
and added fuel to the fire of my hatred for Detroit. That's going to be a running theme on this show throughout the eternity, like the rest of the history of this show for however long 901FC continues to exist. Every so often, you're just going to see like the, the sticker will make an appearance. Uh, much of the, you can say it's the same for Tampa. You had a playoff meeting that really ended in absolute gut-wrenching, heartbreak fashion. And so that sets up juicy storylines for the next time you play them in the regular season. And that's what happened tonight. The crowd, obviously not great. Wednesday night, stormed its ass off. A whole lot of other issues at play, which we're not going to go into here. But you, you get a home regular season game against a team that knocked you out of the playoffs last year on your home field. That's just just right for storyline. They're one of the best, most consistent teams in the league. They have already locked up a playoff spot with 50 points. If they win, and this is something that Stephen Glass pointed out after the game, he said, look, if they won, they were going top, not just top of the East, but top of the table for the whole league. So they had stuff to play for. And I don't want to see, um, you know, they hadn't won a game in just about a month. That was something I thought was weird because the form didn't feel all that bad coming into this game, but – uh, uh, heard Pete Pranica, who was on the call for the game tonight, mentioned that they hadn't won in almost a month. They were looking for the first win in almost a month. And I was like, that can't be right. And then went back and looked at, yeah, the last month, last win was August 12th. And here we are, September the 6th. So just about a month. Not a whole lot of games in that time, but still. So you're jacked, you're ready to go. And, you know, Memphis quarterback Seth Hennigan doing the guitar smash tonight, probably if not the best, a top three guitar smash. He jacked it so hard that a huge chunk of the guitar went flying off onto the field. I mean, it was true carnage. Very impressive. We need, I mean, Seth Hennigan's probably the biggest name that we've had do a guitar smash for 901 FC since 2019. I know, I think at one point in 21, they had Ryan Silverfield do it, but you know, his record's not particularly good. He doesn't have a whole lot of personality. Uh, he doesn't, you know, move the needle the way Mike Norvell did when Mike Norvell was the Tigers football coach here. Mike Norvell still has the best response to being named Celebrity Guitar Smasher with the uh, John Belushi gift from Animal House of him smashing the guitar while the dude's playing guitar on the stairs in the frat house. It makes me kind of want to watch Animal House now. But probably since 2019, that year, I think uh, D'Angelo Williams – former Tiger running back, Mike Norvell, Tiger basketball coach, uh, Tiger football coach, excuse me, Penny Hardaway, Tiger basketball coach, uh, John Morant and Jaron Jackson Jr., both Grizzlies players, did guitar smashes that year. Zach Myers from Shinedown, I think one of the, the kid who played the intern on Bluff City Law while they were shooting here in Memphis did a guitar smash for a game. Uh, you, 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 the problem with the guitar smashes in 2019 is that you got through all the all of the big-name people very early on. Um, so Seth Hennigan doing it tonight, did a great job, obviously the biggest name in quite some time, and that set the stage for what would be an explosive game. Now I don't want to see falls behind. You know, it's kind of a back-and-forth game, really. It was a very evenly played game, I thought. Both teams felt like for the whole game went pedal to the metal, which, is, you know, I was a little bit surprised at, and we'll touch on here in a minute, that as the game wore on and Tampa had the lead, they were up two to one. It kind of surprised me that they kept their pedal, their their foot to the pedal to the metal, and kept trying to score. It almost reminded me of Brazil and Croatia at the last World Cup, where Brazil's up in extra time, and they're still trying to score. And you're like, "No, what are you doing? You sit on, you defend, bunker down, defend the lead. Don't leave yourself open to a counterattack." And what happened? Croatia on a counterattack. Tied the game up, won the game on penalties. You know, maybe there's a little bit to be said for that same thing happening tonight. But part of the issue there is that Tampa did not have Nikki Law, their full-time head coach. For whatever reason, for personal reasons, did not make the trip with the team to Memphis. So they had their assistant, Stuart uh, Dobson, I think is what his name was. Yeah, Stuart Dobson. It was Stuart Dobson, and I remember because, according to his picture here, he looked kind of like Stuart Robson, uh, pundit for ESPN. 
pundit and color commentator, normally paired with either Derek Ray or John Champion for like the European Championships, World Cup, that sort of thing. Uh, looked, and his name sounded like Stuart Robson, which I thought was interesting. But anyway, that's neither really neither here nor there. But you have to, you do have to wonder if Tampa had their regular coach in attendance tonight, if if it would have been a little bit different. And good for good for Memphis that it wasn't. And that that's something I see you see in sports a lot. Well, you beat this team, but this team was missing so and so and so and so and so and so. Don't care. Not going to apologize for it. You beat who they put in front of you. You play who they put in front of you, and you beat them or you don't. Uh, nobody should be making apologies for beating teams that get put in front of them. And Nina Wesley will certainly not be making any apologies for beating Tampa without their coach. Nor should they. Uh, so Tampa goes up 1-0, and it was one of the more frustrating goals I've seen Nina Wesley give up this year because long ball from the keeper to the attacker who scores. This was not like a secondary hockey assist. This was assist straight from the keeper to the person who scored. That was frustrating. But I will give 9 one see credit. That could have been a scenario, given the way the form had been coming into this game. Wasn't bad, but it wasn't great. That could have been one where you just go, you just, you just mail it in. You hit F it, move on down the road. Because this is a team, look, that's a team that was already locked up a playoff spot and was shooting for first place in the league. And that you could have very easily seen a scenario where 901 FC mailed it in. Try again next time. They didn't do that. They bounced back. They kept up the pressure. They were very good at connecting passes in the final third, which we hadn't seen in quite some time from them. And they found an equalizer. And they went into the half 1 1. And then they came out of the half and gave up their second goal almost the exact same way they gave up the first goal. Only this time it was a former 901 FC player who put the ball away, Cal Jennings. I swear, to t- I swear, every time you look up, he's played 83 games and scored 43 goals. How does this dude not start for every team that he plays for? If you recall, in 2020, Tim Mulqueen wouldn't put Cal Jennings on the field, and the minute that Ben Pierman took over, Cal Jennings, goal. Cal Jennings, goal. Cal Jen- like the last four games, I think it was, Cal Jennings scored in every one of them. So you're down 2-1. to one. And it's getting to be the 80 something minute, and you've had – a lot of half chances. There were a lot. There were three or four through balls that got to Bruno Lapa, and for whatever reason, it just got stuck on his feet. So that was frustrating, and he got subbed out, which I thought was was a, was a decent substitution move there by Coach Class because this dude had had killed maybe three attacks, three promising chances in very promising areas of the field, and it's two to one, and out of, like out of not quite out of nowhere, but. Again, I was, I was very surprised. There were a couple of times where Tampa came down trying to score and Memphis was able to counter. And for whatever reason, a pass was too far. Ball got cut on somebody's feet. Good diving play by a defender or the or, the, or Jack Sparrow in goal. His name's not really Jack. I don't, uh, I've got the roster right here. Uh, Connor Sparrow, but I'm going to call him Jack Sparrow because that's more fun. Jack Sparrow makes, you know, last second punch, whatever. It just felt, it was one of those ones where it was a little bit discouraging that the chances weren't being put away, but you still felt like they were at least going to get an equalizer. And that's what happened. They got an equalizer. It finished two to two. How Jeremy Kelly got so wide open at the back post, I don't know. And I don't really care. And that's a Tampa problem and not a Memphis problem. And they will very gladly say, thank you very much. And it in, it's two to two. So you thought, all right, thank God. Whew. At least got a point out of it. So we're now we're not sweating playoff spots, but you know we're still sweating hosting playoff. But now we're you know we got the point. We're not losing. Nobody's making up ground on us. We still got games in hand. We're in good shape. Uh, that wasn't the end of it. There was a foul at midfield, and it was one where you know maybe it could have. It was one of those ones that it could have gone either way. I don't have a problem if it gets called on either side. And it's also one of the ones where since it's like that, you almost could just let it go. But the referee called a foul for Memphis. And for whatever reason, Stuart Dobson lost his mind, lost his mind. Maybe he was mad because the team didn't know how to defend properly and gave up a goal to a wide open goal scorer at the back post. Maybe he was just mad that he was having to make decisions that he didn't know how to make. I don't know. Uh, but he just started running his mouth. And the fourth official, like, immediately was like, hey, ref, get over here, give this dude a caution. I'm tired of listening to this dude. Out comes the card. 
And then we haven't restarted. And I'm typing has been cautioned and showing yellow card for dissent, blah, blah, blah. Send tweet. And then I look and I hear everybody, woo, like the whole crowd. What was left of them goes crazy. Why is the crowd going? And I look, I see the ref putting the red card back in his pocket. And it has dawned on me that Tampa's coach, while being cautioned and shown a yellow card for dissent, did not sit there and go, you know what? Maybe I should shut the hell up. He did not, in fact, shut the hell up. He kept running his mouth and as such was given a second yellow and shown a red and told, goodbye. And that's one thing, like, for me as a referee, if I'm in the process of giving you a card, shut up. Just shut up. There is nothing good going to come from you continuing to run your mouth while I'm giving you a card. I had it happen on, like, a U15 game at a tournament in Snowden this year. Gave the kid a yellow. Told, kept running his mouth. I'm like, dude, I just gave you a yellow. Stop talking. He said, what, dude, shut the hell up and watch the damn game is what he told me. So he got a second yellow and he got a red. 15 minutes into the game. Same thing with the Tampa coach. Like, bro, why are you still yelling at the ref? I mean, I guess perhaps maybe he thinks for some reason if he's been, just been given yellow, he's not going to be given another one right away. That uh, that did not go well for him. And it is because he ran his mouth and got sent off, got himself sent off and dismissed from the game that 901 FC had the extra time in the stoppage time to go down and draw a penalty that eventually won them the game. This loss, this game, this result for 901 FC rest all the credit to the 901 FC players and the coaching staff for uh, powering through, continuing to fight, and finding a way to win. All credit to them. I should stop throwing my pen around. All credit to them for that. From a Tampa perspective, this loss rests solely on their assistant coach, Stuart Dodson. Dobson. That's who the, without his antics, without him showing his ass and getting dismissed, 901 FC does not have time to go down and get the win. But he wanted to act a fool. He wanted to have a pissing contest with the referee. Newsflash, the referee will win the pissing contest 10 times out of 10. That will happen. And he got dismissed. 901 FC gets a little bit of extra time, very obvious penalty awarded, and up steps Aaron Malloy. Aaron Malloy, who missed the penalty against Tampa in the playoffs last year, has a shot at redemption. It's a, it's it's almost too perfect. It is almost the absolute storybook ending. I turned in the press box. I said, I've seen the Aaron Malloy penalty against Tampa movie before. Others in the press box said, yes, shot at redemption. Oh, I like that. Shot at, yeah, it, that's perfect. Shot at redemption. The penalty was, was missed. It was not a good penalty. Much like the one against Tampa in the playoffs last year was not a good penalty. And if I'm not mistaken, there was another game. I think it was the Miami game this year. It was one where a bunch of people scored. It could have been the Tulsa game, but I think it was the Miami game. Malloy also missed a penalty. So some somebody uh, reached out and said, I'm about done with the Aaron Malloy penalty-taking experiment. The, the, proof's in, the proof is in the pudding there, guys, I think. It, I think we might need to, 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 to look elsewhere for somebody to be our penalty taker, I get that when Leston Paul's not around, he's been the captain and that you know, he, he he's a very good player, but I think we're like one for three in his last four penalties. Uh, you need to be at least 50-50, 25%. It really ain't, ain't cutting it for me. But he kept his head in it. He saw that his penalty was saved and immediately followed up on the rebound, which I think the goalkeeper got, Jack Sparrow got a piece of. And then it was just chaos, pell-mell, running down there. Um, it ended up being an own goal. I'm not sure who all was down there. There were like two Tampa players, one Memphis player, Malloy still at the penalty spot. Jack Sparrow was kind of in no man's land. This is also had left. This irritates the hell out of me. 
every time a goalkeeper gives up a goal where there's any number of attacking players within the six-yard box, oh, look, offside, offside. Like, bro, they were all behind the ball, and they all came running at you. And not offside. Put your arm down. Own up to it. Get on your defense. You saved a penalty, you saved the rebound, and then your defender put the ball in, in, his, in his own net. Get on your defenders. Get on your coach for getting himself tossed out of the game. Okay? That's on y'all. It's not offside. You're not going to be offside at the taking of a penalty kick. So Memphis gets the win. Memphis gets the win. That is what is most important. And I'll tell you what it reminded me of the most. I've teased it. I've got it written down right here in Chicken Scratch. Uh, if you'll recall, around the same time in the calendar year, around September of 2021, there's another game where we're real late in the game. We're into stoppage time. 9-1 FC's down 2-1. to one. It's not looking good. All of a sudden, there's an equalizer. And all of a sudden, there's a game winner. What, what, what game could I be talking about? That would be the Birmingham Legion game in September, Labor Day weekend of 2021, which I missed to stay at home and watch football because I was going to be missing the Notre Dame-Florida State game that Sunday to drive to Nashville to cover uh, Greg Berhalter committing soccer crimes against soccer in the U.S. World Cup qualifier against Canada, in which in the men's restroom at halftime, I got into an argument with John Strong, Stuart Holden, and Brian Strauss. That's not a uh, that's not to be a discussion to be had here. But if you see me, I'd be more than happy to tell you about it. The Birmingham Legion game in 2021 was the turning point of that season, and really the turning point for this organization. 2019 was not good debut season. 2020 was awful. 2021 was not going great. A little bit better, but not overall. You know, just about where 2019 was, and that game. Now, it's a little bit different than this one, but this game to me was very similar to that Birmingham Legion game in 2021. Subtle differences. Obviously, the game-winning goal was not a goal of the year, much the way that it was, you know, like it was in 2021. Also wasn't a rivalry game, and it's a Wednesday and not a Saturday, so there were fewer people there tonight than there were against Birmingham, but very, very similar. Now, I don't want to see doing a little bit better this, at this point than they were in 2021, but this feels like a switch could be flipped. Now, I've made a bold prediction about this team this year before. Not so much a bold prediction, but a bold statement. After the Louisville game, you'll recall, I said if they get seven out of nine possible points in their next three home games, I will be willing to say this is the most complete, most complete 901 FC team ever. They got seven out of nine points in those next three games, and then promptly went seven games winless. So I looked a little bit foolish, but I'm, I'm putting, I'm going out on a limb again. I'm stepping into the, I'm, I'm, I'm opening myself up to be hurt again. This game against Tampa, like the Birmingham game in 2021, same time of the calendar year, almost the same set of the same scenario, two very late goals to go from two, one down to three, two win. I feel like this is a turning point for this team this season. This will be the game that gives them the extra juice to get back up into the top four and host a home playoff game. 2021, they used that to go on a run to get into the playoffs. This year, they're going to use it to go on the run to not only get into the playoffs, but to host a home playoff game. That is my bold prediction. And so what is the schedule look like coming up? Well, there are, after tonight, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games left, four of which are at home. Tonight was the start of a three game homestand for 901 FC. Tonight against Tampa, Saturday night, very quick turnaround. Excuse me. Saturday night is a home game against Monterey Bay. Don't know a whole lot about them, never played them before. I'll do some digging. Then you get the following Saturday, the 16th, a home game against Hartford Athletic. They are awful. They are hapless. They are the worst team in the league. You have already beaten them this year. You went to Hartford and beat them 2 to nothing. I don't know if Tab Ramos has been fired yet, but he might have. Uh, so that's your – got a three-game homestand, two of which are Saturday games. 
This is another three-game homestand where you need seven out of nine points. You cannot drop points to Hartford. You just, you just, you have to get all three points in that game. The Monterey Bay game, they did pull off a cup set in the U.S. Open Cup. I know. I'm pretty sure they beat the Earthquakes. That would be one. You got the three points tonight. I would prefer three. Obviously, would prefer three points against Monterey Bay. But if you if you only get one, but you got to get three points against Hartford. So that's Saturday the 9th, and then Saturday the 16th are your next two home games. Then you have two road games at Birmingham, which I believe is a rescheduled game from there was a ga- there was a game at Birmingham that had to get rescheduled because of Open Cup stuff, I think. Or maybe there was a game that I don't want to see was supposed to have that got rescheduled because they had to go to Birmingham in the Open Cup. Nope. If I'm not mistaken, this game against Birmingham had to be rescheduled because Birmingham beat Memphis in the Open Cup and advanced and had to play Charlotte or Columbus. No, Charlotte. I think they had to play Charlotte. They got knocked out by Miami, and that was a big crowd because Messi to Miami had been announced, but he wasn't there yet. And so I think a lot of people thought Messi was going to be there. They got like 18,000 people there for it. Um. But so you got to go to Birmingham, and then you got a, a, a Saturday the 23rd at Tampa. It's a little bit weird with the scheduling, how you had at Indy, and then two games later at home against Indy, and then you get Tampa at home, and then later this month, Tampa away. Strange scheduling, but oh well. I'm sure they'll be looking to return the favor for tonight, so you want to have your head sw- heads on a swivel for that game. And then you get two games at home, Saturday the 30th, Saturday the 7th, Saturday against Birmingham. Again, real quick turnaround between two teams. This one, a little bit more understandable because of some scheduling quirks with the Open Cup. And then El Paso Locomotive. So your four remaining home games, that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to try to get some more people to AutoZone Park. Four remaining home games. Saturday, September 9th against Monterey Bay. Saturday, September 16th against Hartford Athletic. Saturday, September 30th against Birmingham Legion. And then Saturday, October 7th against El Paso Locomotive. You got four home games. They're all at Saturday. They're all at 7 p.m. And then the very last game of the year is Saturday, October the 13th, away to New Mexico United. That's an interest, that's an interesting one. That is a, that's a place I'd love to see the U.S. men's national team play. They get great support in New Mexico. But apparently you're only allowed to put the U.S. men's national team in the newest MLS stadiums. But that's a to- different topic for a different show. So I think that is going to do it for us here tonight. Talked about a lot. Talked about the road leading into tonight. Took a painful trip down memory lane. Recapped the game tonight and looked at the upcoming schedule. So uh, to be on the lookout for more stuff from the 901 Soccer Podcast, planning on doing at least one or two more U of M women's games. Those are going to be on Thursday nights, if the schedule memory serves me correctly. Schedule permitting, I will try to do a U of M men's game. They are off to a very good start. There are three wins and one draw. Uh, they they had a great come from behind win the other night uh, at Central Arkansas over in Conway. Uh, they were down one nothing and scored two goals in the last couple of minutes of the game, just the way 901 FC did tonight. They're coming off an NCAA tournament appearance last year. So if they can keep it going, and the women's team at the U of M can keep it going, I might be becoming, I might be becoming, be becoming, is that a real thing? A much more common fixture out at the track and field stadium at the Park Avenue campus. Uh, so just keep your eyes peeled for that. Follow the 901 Soccer Podcast on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I'm Lawrence Dockery at LDoc93. If there's anybody out there in listener land that is interested in sponsoring this show or any of the other shows here on Bluff City Media, we got a lot. We got all your Memphis sports right here at Bluff City Media. Soccer, 901 FC, U of M, Memphis Americans. You know, we got it all. I got I got the soccer on lockdown. If you're interested in sponsoring this show, reach out and let me know. Plenty of Tiger football coverage. Tiger football season just started. Seth Hennigan did the guitar, guitar smash tonight. It was great. A lot of Grizzlies coverage. A lot of, I mean, there's Showboats coverage. There's Redbirds coverage. Tiger basketball coverage. Like, like if there's a Memphis sport... We got it. So if you are out there and have goods or services that you want advertised, reach out to somebody here at Bluff City Media. 
me at ldoc93 on Twitter. Not on one soccer podcast. Not on one soccer at not on one soccer pod on Twitter. Not on one soccer on Facebook. Bluff City Media at Bluff City underscore Media on Twitter. Bluff City Media on Facebook. If you are interested in any of that, please reach out. We'd be more than happy to work something out with you. But other than that, I think that is going to do it here for us tonight. Hope to be back. I know I'll be back at AutoZone Park on Saturday. Hope to have another podcast on Saturday night after hopefully a win against Monterey Bay. Until then, we will talk to you next time.